So I'm Nick. I'm the CEO and co-founder of, of TrustShare. So today I'm going to go run through a quick presentation on marketplaces and banks of the future. Um, so last year at the Marketplace Conference, uh, there was a, a whole stage focused on embedded finance and this whole topic about marketplaces getting closer to the transaction. So I'm hoping today I'll give you a different perspective from what was there last year and try and keep it very simple in terms of different concepts um, and also potentially give you the mindset of a bank and get a different perspective going forward. So this is a slide, uh, two photos off my mobile actually, uh, from the first European Marketplace Conference in 2018. Um, and it was a Future of Marketplaces uh, conference uh, of event with Adavinta, and, uh, who, who were ships dead at the time, and Deal Room presenting. And you can see here these concepts are kind of what has driven kind of thinking in the last four years with marketplaces. Whether you've got on the left, marketplaces going from getting close to the transaction, having more transactional ownership, being able to charge a higher percentage on the transaction. And on the, le on the, on the right here, You've got marketplaces going from listings, payments, adding logistical tools. And the final point that we had in our mind in 2018 was that we would start to, marketplaces would start to take inventory themselves. So they would buy the good, own the good, and transact with using the good. Um, and this kind of, I disagreed with this at the time, because I kind of felt that marketplaces, the whole point and the power of marketplaces is you're connecting buyers and sellers. Um, but you're staying asset light. So you're not owning the, owning the item. You're not, uh, not using capital to, and cash flow to kind of handle that transaction. Um, so you can build out your network effects quite quickly, and you don't need to raise mega rounds to manage that cash flow. And I felt that in 2018, we were talking about a kind of a mindset move into a mindset of a store, of an e-commerce business, um, where you're changing your mindset not about how you connect buyers and sellers, but how you can buy the item and become a big e-commerce e dealer. So you got, you got know, people like Kazoo in the UK uh, raising big rounds to own the asset and become the market leader, but kind of falling away from core marketplace principles of just connecting buyers and sellers and um, being able to scale very quickly from that. Um, so I believe the mindset now, just from conversations in the last few years, is that there's we're moving towards the mindset of a, of a bank. So a bank, for example, in this scenario, wouldn't think, how can I own the asset? It would be thinking, how do I finance the asset? How do I insure the asset? So you're, it's more about transaction ownership rather than actually asset ownership, rather than actually owning the thing that you're buying and selling. Um, so yeah, banks are asset heavy on paper, but really asset light in reality. And I want to take you a bit of a uh, bit of perspective on. Uh, I'm going to run for the next 30 minutes. Um, how banks are interacting with neo banks to give you a different kind of perspective about how what banks are thinking about when they think about neo banks, and how I think that banks might start to feel like this with marketplaces, and how we, they can interact in a similar way. Uh, I talk about fintech-enabled marketplaces, a coi uh, obviously a term coined by NFX. Um, a particular area of banking, which I think is very attractive for marketplaces to be able to take over, which is transaction banking. How many in the room know about or have heard of the word transaction banking or transaction banking? So one or two. It's very little. It's outside of banking circles. It's not really well known, um, but it's a very, very large business uh, within that sector. One that marketplaces, I think, are better positioned to, to service than actual banks directly. Um, why now? Um, and the impact of open banking, and then to, I, I want it to be practical and, and keep it straightforward so you have actionable next steps. So I'm going to talk about the actual practical guide to what embedded lending looks like on the market at the moment and what options you have there in terms of financing. Um, and then I guess why marketplaces need to move banks, uh, money like a bank to kind of achieve this. So uh, at a kind of show of hands, uh, Revolut, Monzo, Stalin, those sort of banks, how many people in the room kind of use them? Okay, yeah. Well, okay, like it looks like 75% in the room, so a lot of people use them. I use two <laughs> for different purposes. Um, so banks are scared about neobanks because of their accessibility. The fact that you can go over and open an account, it's really easy to use. The customer service is you know, 10x immediately. Um, but if you look at the performance of the actual products that these businesses offer, you know, what's your interest rate on holding funds in that account? 
terrible. You get a much better service from going to a bank directly. But people use them because of the accessibility. And, and banks are scared of, uh, you know, there's tech giants as well who are kind of moving into space uh, through payment methods first, but they're also talking about offering current, current accounts. Um, and this kind of like setup with banks being scared of, of neobanks for accessibility is something the marketplaces can replicate. And, and one thing to really note is it's not like neobanks have this bank. They don't, they don't start and just have a banking infrastructure. They're working with pre-existing banks. So, it's, so banks are actually helping with the hold, hold, holding funds for some of these neobanks. Uh, and fintech typically sits in between. So they kind of translate the pre-existing banks and allow them to neobanks access through fintech for different services, like payments and uh, different parts of the, the services provided by different fintechs. Um, so my question is, you know, why can't marketplaces do the same? You know, why can't marketplaces access banking services like fintechs? Um, and do uh, surely banks, uh, marketplaces have a much better level of accessibility to their customers? Because you already have a pre-existing set of buyers and sellers who are transacting through the platform. So that accessibility is there from day one. So you're kind of almost, I'd say, a more vertical Pacific type model that Apple and Google have in terms of they have a lot of customers. But those customers are spread across lots of verticals, whereas you as a marketplace will have lots of customers all in the same vertical. And for consumer marketplaces, I'm going to focus mainly on business marketplaces for this talk. Uh, I can talk a bit about consumer marketplaces towards the end. When I say consumer marketplaces, I mean uh, marketplaces with individual buyers, buyers on the marketplace who are checking out are individuals, whereas business marketplaces are more marketplaces where the buyer is a business. Um, but neobanks are scared of, uh, neobanks are causing impact and disrupting cons consumer banking, you know, current account banking, where I think B2B marketplaces in particular can work with fintech is get better accessibility to transaction banking. Okay, so no one knows what transaction banking is in the room, but from one person, so I mean, it's important to show. So transaction banking services are a, a big division within banks, and they facilitate the safe transaction of money from one country to another. Um, and they typically work with big corporate B2B customers. Uh, it's the fastest growing sector of banks worldwide. So this is the top 12 investment bank revenue performance from 2018. I couldn't find any data from later. But you can see it's gone up 9% compared to the invest investment banking arm is 0.3%. And also, the num uh, you know, investment banking, everyone knows banks do investment banking. Transaction banking, no one's heard of transaction banking in this room. And they're responsible for a fifth there of the revenue, and it's growing year on year. So, so these services kind of fit into kind of four main sectors. So you have payments, so cross-border payments and FX for big corporate customers. How do you manage your FX risk? Uh, escrow services, when you're doing a transaction cross-border, you need to hold funds in escrow, wait until the service has been delivered, protected, and then release. Uh, if there's low trust in that transaction. Banking services for like treasury services, that kind of holding money for big corporates, making sure money is held in the right regions. Uh, and then one part that I'm going to talk about a lot today is, is credit. So credit here, trade finance, lending, credit insurance, and invoice factoring. Um, so there are quite a few different terms there. So I want to break them down. So lending, for example. Um, so Elizabeth is here, for example, in the front row. Let's say I'm a bank and I want to lend to Elizabeth. As a bank, I would give Elizabeth some funds, and then she would then pay me back on a set certain terms. It's a loan. It's straightforward. Uh, uh, credit insurance is if, uh, if you are paying Elizabeth and uh, I want to offer credit insurance, what, what I would do is say, if you don't pay Elizabeth, then I will pay instead. So I will ensure that transaction, and I will basically take the risk on for that transaction. So that, that, that's a, a really popular method for cross-border transactions to ensure that the buyers will pay the sellers. But there's no funding associated with that, right? So I'm not paying Elizabeth up front. I'm waiting until you pay. And if you don't pay, I'm going to pay Elizabeth myself. Um, and then finally, invoice factoring. So invoice factoring is a similar setup, um, apart from you're going to pay Elizabeth. And what I will do as a bank, I will say, I, I reckon you're going to pay Elizabeth, so I will buy that invoice, and you're going to pay me instead. And then a, I, will, I will take a percentage fee, basically, for that. So those three products are the main products that represent credit, and how they interact with each other is quite important. 
Um, and that, that effectively is B2B credit. Invoice factor, if you've heard of buy now, pay later for consumers, uh, Buy now, pay later for consumers is just invoice factoring, effectively, where you have an individual who's paying a business, and the business says, uh, the invoice factoring business says, I will buy that invoice from you as a business seller, and then the individual will pay you as an invoice factoring company rather than me. So that's Klarna's business, for example. That's, that's, that's how it works. Um, so, so fintech enabled marketplaces, I kind of touched on this already. This, this slide is just completely plagiarized from NFX's blog. Uh, about marketplaces going from lead generational to transactional to managed, adding uh, logistics and insurance services to fintech enabled, adding financial services into the platform. Um, and I 100% agree with this compared to, because this is the mindset of a bank rather than the mindset of a store. Um, and yeah, marketplaces, because the fact that marketplaces are typically very heavily verticalized, you're focused on one particular vertical rather than a generalist marketplace, it means that you can solve specific, you've got specific customer access. So that industry, you can solve specific problems for that market, and you've got the market experience to help translate these services that are provided on a generous basis from banks. Um, FinTech and Mabel marketplaces can work with banks in a similar way, if structured correctly, because you need to make sure you're not regu you need to be regulated, uh, which is something that we offer. Um, and also, and probably one of the most important things, um, if we talk about consumer buy now, pay later, and I said that's the same as invoice factoring, the reason why consumer buy now, pay later is really popular is because it's available at checkout and it's easy. And you just, it's the same, it's accessibility at point of checkout. So having financial services at the point of checkout is really important. And the checkout for B2B marketplaces can be a traditional checkout, but also it can be paying on invoice, for example, um, because it's just how people are interacting and how people are changing how they, they check out for services. Um, so, so transaction banking, those kind of four points, they are all very well positioned at the point of sale. If you had to go on a marketplace, make a purchase, and then you need to contact your bank to get that service offering, you can get a much lower uptake than if it was available there and then, and it's quick and easy to, to offer. So uh, transaction ownership, I, want, uh, transaction, I feel like uh, transaction ownership, I believe marketplaces, as they get closer to the transaction, will start to kind of really own the transaction. Uh, you can see this in lenders at the moment. Lenders often, um, often will ask a few bits of data to offer you a loan. Often they're, they're asking for, you know, what's your marketplace's transactions? Uh, can we link up with open banking so we can see your activity on the transaction, of your transaction activity? Marketplaces have, can have both, these data, this, both this contextual data because they can see what transactions are for. Whereas uh, banks can only see the money movement. They can only see money moving, but they can't see what it's for. Um, and the f uh, open banking allows marketplaces and other businesses to be able to see transaction activity for their buyers and sellers without, uh, and also having the context of, um, of the actual transactions. Uh, open banking, this is a term. How many people are familiar with open banking? So there's a show of hands. OK, it's so about half. OK, so I explained open banking as well. So open banking, often misdescribed. Open banking is simply, in the Europe, there's a, um, there's a set of regulations that are, are, are put in place to offer better competitiveness with, with banks. There's two types. One is the ability to read transaction activity on an account. So regulated firms can work with banks with their APIs, gather information of the transaction activity of an individual or business, as long as they could give consent. And then you can see what transaction activity are happening in their account. That's called AIS. It's an account, open banking. There's also PIS, which is payments initiation, where and we use this a lot. It's our most popular payment method, where um, people can make transactions from their banking app and just press. Uh, they can go on our checkout, for example. They say pay. They get redirected to their banking app. It opens, and they just press one button with the pay already completed and the checkout already completed, they make one payment. It's a bit like when you do a card payment sometimes and you get a notification on your phone to say confirm, which is 3DS. Open banking is that, but without the, without the card. There's no card involved at all. So open banking gives, could give marketplaces in the future access to the other transactions that buyers and sellers are doing, and they have the, the first level of context of seeing is this buyer and seller good in terms of the transaction activity they've done on this platform? I think this is one step in the future. 
Um, but it's something that I believe that marketplaces are better positioned than banks necessarily to offer best lending decisions uh, for their buyers and sellers, which is really cool. So our mission to TrustShare is to make fintech simple for marketplaces. So we want to try and get all this stuff into actionable tools. So I want to focus on how we can make this actionable. Um, so that I'm going to do a specific guide to embedded lending, how it works. So marketplaces, unlike normal merchants or other e-shops, they have three main party groups. They obviously have buyers, they have themselves as a marketplace, and they have sellers, typically. Um, so how do, going back to the slide with neobanks connected to with traditional banks, how do banks uh, interact with these three parties? Um, so for credit, for example, there's, there's a few ways you can get credit into your platform to offer liquidity. So one is credit to buyers. So you focus on buyers and you go, how can I add value and extend payment terms to those buyers? How can I offer the ability to pay in 30 days, 60 days? And there's, lots, there's quite a few different providers for business and for consumer. Business buy now, pay later, and consumer buy now, pay, pay later, uh, where you can go on, offer it as a checkout option, and pay later. Um, so that's one option where you can get it embedded. Fits under business beat, buy now, pay later is the kind of the search term for that. It's risk free. If the buyer doesn't pay, the buy now, pay later business chases for the money, so you can't lose any money. Uh, but it's opt in and it's typically small coverage. So typically these businesses will have a small coverage. They have maybe five countries they cover or even maybe one country they cover. But of course, marketplaces, you have buyers and sellers in loads of different regions. So uh, if you're a marketplace with just only buyers in one region, I would recommend going for a business buy now, pay later option to work with them in that particular region. Um, there's also credit to marketplace, marketplaces. Um, so the question there is, how can I add work into capital to add liquidity to my marketplace payments? So how do I add money into that account? And this, this probably sounds rare, but actually I think this is the most popular one that marketplaces do. Lots of marketplaces will transact through their own current account, and the reason they do that and don't use a PSP is because they want to pay their sellers early out of their own operational cash and then wait until buyers uh, pay them later. So there's loads of different options of that. Typically, you get to a point where your GMV, your volume you're doing in terms of payments just becomes too much. You don't have the cash flow. You can't solve the cash flow issue. And marketplaces have gone to different options of that. So this is rare but you can raise debt for an SPV, for example. Um, Jobs and Talent, uh, Mercado Libre, they're two uh, marketplaces who've worked with banks to provide a lending to them so they can offer those, the payments to, to buyers and sellers there and offer liquidity through the marketplace. But it's a hard, hard route, of course. And obviously, it's not as easy as going to your bank and saying, can you give us money and you don't have to worry about paying us back. So there's a risk involved as well. Um, and finally, there's credit to sellers. So it's another popular way of getting credit into the platform, and you're taking it from perspective of sellers, so how can I pay sellers upfront for future sales they're going to have on that platform? So this is embedded lending. Strength again, it's like business buy now, pay later. Actually, business buy now, pay later is actually, from a geeky point of view, actually uh, just a loan. It's not buy now, pay later. It's not invoice factoring. It's just a loan to the buyer. Um, so again, it's risk-free. You, you have a marketplace who's uh, doing various transactions, and they have the option to get paid early, and then they can embed an embedded lender into that. Uh, weaknesses, again, it's again small coverage, so you only get a few countries you can support. Uh, and again, it's opt-in. And opt-in is a problem. The reason why opt-in is potentially a problem is the credit risk. Only people who really need the money will be op offering the option. So you only get the really bad people who are unlikely to pay as the ones who go for it. So it tends to be more expensive as well. So speaking to marketplace founders in this space who are looking at this sort of option, they want to control funds as their own. They want to be act like credit to marketplaces. But they want the biggest global coverage. Uh, and they want 0% risk, so they want to take no risks. They want the best bits of business buy now, pay later, and embedded lending with no risk, but the best bits of marketplace lending, so as many countries in the world as you possibly can do. Um, so we are launching very soon um, the ability to kind of execute this. So we're going to do all the, the, the difficult translation pieces in the background, 
but we're going to allow marketplaces to control funds as their own, be able to design their own payment terms to buyers and sellers. They can offer it so that buyers and sellers don't even have to kind of opt into the service kind of on a case-by-case -case basis, where all buyers and sellers are offering credit risk, uh, credit in, in, implemented on their platform. We're going to roll out across 220 countries, as long as either the buyer or seller is in a major European market. So buyers and sellers can spread across as many countries as possible to, to, to basically match the reach that marketplaces have across the world. Make it instantly scalable. So rather than saying it's 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, you can call it any number of days, design your own products, as long as you don't lend for over 120 days. Because over 120 days, it's actually just a bad lending decision. You get higher risk of people defaulting. Um, and always being 0% risk for the marketplace. So yeah, just to summarize, uh, we didn't actually intend to do this, <laughs> if I'm uh, being honest. But the, uh, what we offer fits very closely with what transaction banking offers. Uh, it's something that we only came across as a business nine, 10 months ago, but it fits quite narrowly to what marketplaces want. So if marketplaces are asking for these sort of services, and these services are already being offered by, by banks, it shows that there's going to be a collision course here of opportunity uh, for, for marketplaces. So yeah, we offer complete fintech layer for marketplaces across payments, banking, credit, and escrow. Payments, we move money from buyer to seller in 15 seconds, which is our biggest seller. The fact we can move money from buyer to seller very quickly, where most payment providers take five, five, 10 days. Um, and we do FX capabilities in 35 currencies, local payment routes in 50 countries. So we have a very large payment network that we built out to support Lar typically larger transactions, I would say, in B2B space. We do escrow out of the box, uh, and then we allow people to open accounts in USD, EUR, and GBP. Um, and then finally, on the credit side of things, I, tr I try to explain in simple terms the difference between invoice factoring, lending, and credit insurance. I hope that made, made sense. Uh, so we're looking to, rather than have to explain that to every customer that we onboard, we want to instead just offer it as a simple API where it's just credit. You, know, you can design your own terms, and then we decide how it's structured on the back end. So that, oh, no, I've got one more slide. So um, yeah, I guess to, to answer the actual question of the talk, uh, will marketplaces become the banks of the future? So it's an interesting topic. Uh, one thing to think about is that marketplaces themselves are uh, no, sorry, banks themselves are actually marketplaces. So banks, you're connecting consumers and businesses who are doing deposits with effectively the core mechanism with investment areas where you can invest. So that could be offering a loan to someone else, could be investing in the stock market. But then, to some extent, banks are marketplaces. So there is actually quite a lot of similarity between them. Um, but, ba but marketplaces don't have the deposit mechanism. So that's the biggest thing that marketplaces do, don't have that banks do. So you don't hold money on your marketplace for a long time. I don't think that will happen. I don't think marketplaces, buyers and sellers will want to get the money out of their accounts as quickly as possible to use those funds for cash flow. But you never know in the future, potentially marketplaces, because they're in the point of transaction, could hold onto that money and use it. Uh, but there would need to be regulators as a bank. So I think that's a big stretch, frankly. So I think that they could be kind of the best point of access for these transaction banking services, but not actually kind of run the full infrastructure end to end. That's it. So very quick presentation. So I didn't want to uh, take too much time, but I'm happy to have any questions. Cool. Uh, thank you very much for that. I, th I thought it was incredibly informative. And uh, I think uh, also, you know, you were uh, showing a slide with something that was launching uh, later this year. Um, I just wanted to, to ask, because, you know, obviously I saw that. I think it looks great, uh, by, by the way. But how does that tie in with PSD2? Yeah, that's a very good question, actually. Um, so PSD2, um, who's familiar with PSD2? Oh, interesting. I thought it would be almost 100%. OK. So uh, yeah, it's a very good question. So PSD2 uh, was a regulation that came in that affected marketplaces in Europe, where before PSD2, you could just bank transfer funds out of your current account, and it wouldn't be a problem. There's no 
no issue with doing that. Uh, regulators basically looked at that and went, well, what happens if one of these marketplaces goes bust? They're actually holding customers' money, so therefore they should either be regulators as a payments business, which obviously no one took that route, or work for a payment provider. So that's what PSD2 is. Um, in terms of how it works with PSD2, uh, with our service, all the funds are owned by TrustShare, so we're a regulated payments business in the UK and Europe. Um, so we're holding those funds, safeguarding those funds. Actually, from a legal framework, to give you a full answer, we're an escrow provider, so we hold funds on behalf of the sellers. Um, so that's how we safeguard and segregate those funds. And that's also important because I think quite a lot of marketplaces um, kind of delay the PSD2 kind of question. I'll keep the funds in my current account for as long as possible because it's kind of nice to be able to use the cash flow potentially from time to time. The credit piece is something that I think is going to change a few of those kind of slower movers on marketplaces to kind of, you know, you're adding value, not just saying you have to do it to comply. Um, so, and it links into verification actually. So, verification, um, KYC is sometimes a point of friction. A marketplace, and typically the reason why a marketplace will try and delay that decision as long as possible. Obviously, verification, this is a financial product, you're offering lending services, so verification is absolute a must. It's a complete necessity for that. So I think it will, these sort of services will, they're obviously PSD2 compliant, but also it's going to push people who are not compliant yet to kind of take that step, if that makes sense. Cool. Uh, any other questions? Really? You cool. guys understood everything that Nick said? Wow. <laughs> Clearly, you cool. did a great job. <laughs> uh, oh, we got one more. Yeah. Another one. So, like, cool. Which marketplaces that will benefit from this embedded financial products um, that you're offering, actually? Uh, when you say markets, do you mean like verticals? General, uh, hospitality, what kind of merchants would you see that will be benefiting from these embedded financial products that you're? platforms offering, actually? Yeah, I, I think um, if the transaction value is larger, that typically helps. Because if you're lending for the kind of 10 pounds you know, or 100 pounds, no, no one really cares, really, frankly. You just pay now. Um, so transaction value is important. Uh, it's also a convenience mechanism. So a lot of people look at credit, and they go, credit, oh, it's going to add value for my customers. But also not doing credit, it means that you can't pay at the end of the month. So if you're a marketplace and you're a B2B marketplace and you're asking people to check out there and then, you might be speaking to someone who can't check out there and then, who wants to just pay at the end of the month. So it's actually just allowing people to just do what's like, you know, strangely familiar in terms of just paying on the invoices at the end of the month. So B2B, particularly any market in B2B, either as a convenience mechanism, but also just to add, also to add value as well, particularly where people are buying goods and then selling them on. So those sort of people, because they have cash flow issues that marketplaces can really solve. And, and right now, their options are either negotiating with the seller. And that's actually a really good point, actually. Negotiating with the seller, the seller is the marketplace, typically. So people in their head think the seller is the marketplace. The marketplace should be offering payment terms. So that's why it should be offered there. Um, but in terms of like actual vertical specificity, it's kind of, I wouldn't say there's any particular marketplaces more than others. It, it's basically across all industries. There's an opportunity, I think. Nick, so do you do you actually take credit risk as trust share then, or do you pass on that risk to somebody else? Yes, we part, uh, we work with kind of uh, partners on the back end, and they're taking on that risk. So we're not providing it ourselves, um, just because we're also you know not making the decision on the lending as well. So we basically we're basically translating business buy now pay later into a solution that works for marketplaces. Because if you think about it, um, business buy now, pay later solutions, they're typically they're so, they're built and sold with merchants in mind. Like I'm a, just a normal seller. I'm looking to sell my goods. OK, business buy now, pay later means I can offer new terms. That's great. Whereas marketplaces, obviously, you have buyers and sellers. So by combining both, that's how you can offer kind of those kind of credit terms um, as well. So question at the back. Uh, so this is a bit, bit of a theoretical question, but let's say you were building a platform, a marketplace, that kind of had these different layers that trust share offers, right? Payments, sorry, I'm, I'm looking at the screenshot. Payments, escrow banking, and credit. 
Yeah, exactly that slide. Uh, hypothetically, what do you think will be the point uh, at which a marketplace should start with and then build out to it? So for example, let's say you want to start by offering credit to your, you know, to your members, and then you lay on another financial service as it grows, as the you know, um, adoption grows, as stickiness grows. In your experience, what would you say has been the most um, organic way to start, or where do you think one should start, and when do you think one should, uh, when you're a, a bit at a more mature place, start layering on other services? I don't know if that's... A yeah, no, no, that makes, it makes sense. Like, what, what's the, the best one to start with if you choose one? Yeah. Um, I would say uh, it, it does depend on the marketplace. So in terms of easiest ones, payments is obviously the easiest one to implement. Escrow, very similar. Uh, very similar. Uh, in fact, the, the only difference is one, the money's going through immediately, and the other, it's being held and then waited for a second initiation to release the money. Um, in some markets, escrow isn't suitable because uh, if you're uh, in a B2B space and everyone pays on invoice, they would say, well, I want to pay with the seller directly because I want to pay at the end of the month because I'm not going to pay up front, obviously. Uh, but some markets, escrow is really useful. And actually, I would say between escrow payments, bank, uh, escrow payments and credit, um, if you've got very low trust, escrow is really good. If you've got medium trust, payments are good. I would say with payments, you've got to add value somewhere. If you, just don't, if you just offer payments um, in B2B space, it's quite hard to actually just explain why they're now charged a percentage fee as a, because you're taking your commission fees. Uh, and then credit is where you've got good trust. So it's kind of like layering over those two. We let the marketplaces kind of work out uh, how to do that. Uh, one other thing on that, actually, um, obviously, I'm talking about business buyers on marketplaces. There's also consumer buyers on obviously consumer marketplaces. For those, credit, uh, you need to be very careful with credit because uh, consumer lending is regulated as a business and buy now, pay later businesses, they're kind of on the line, always being careful to make sure they're not construed as being lending. So we're very careful when an individual is involved as either the buyer or seller to make sure that you wouldn't fit under that remit um, because you wouldn't want to be you know, suddenly uh, so we avoid that, basically. Um, yeah, that's, that's, does, that, does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. It does, fundamentally. Yes, thanks. All right. Thanks, Nick. <laughs>